Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, you're probably aware that um, in two weeks' time, uh, my period here as being uh, one of the pastors of the church comes to an end after uh, 32 years. Uh, contrary to rumors, by the way, I'm not retiring. I've had a few people stop me in the street and say, I hear you're retiring. Well, I'm not retiring. I am leaving Greenford Baptist Church and I am leaving local church ministry, but I've been seconded by the BU to a role at Waverley Abbey College where I'm the program lead for a master's program in spiritual formation, which I'm going to be uh, working on there. So uh, not exactly retirement, but uh, definitely a move. So uh, I thought to myself, I've got these final, I'm, I'm not speaking next week because we've got Rachel and Adam here with us again next week, but I've got, got these final couple of weeks, this week, two weeks time. What's the appropriate thing to talk about? So, because I'm coming to an end. So I thought, let's look at the end. So we're going to look at the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. We're going to look at one today, the last but one chapter. And then in two weeks' time, uh, when I'm preaching again, we're going to look at the other chapters. So if you've got a Bible or a mobile phone, this is not an excuse to turn the games on on the mobile phone. Um, just by the way, when I wander around with, with the microphone as I do, I do glance at people's mobile phones. So if you've got the Bible on it, it's okay. But if I see some game, I might just start, stop and ask you what it is you're playing. So, and perhaps you'd like to share that with the rest of the congregation. So just, uh, just I mentioned that in passing. Is that okay? So, um, Revelation is, uh, the book of Revelation, it's, it's um, actually a letter. And it was written by John, and it was sent to churches. Uh, and this would have been read out to the congregation. Um, back in those days, uh, there weren't printing presses and so on, so the letter would have arrived, and it would have been read out to the, to the congregation. And the core theme of Revelation is this. God is in control now and forever. Whatever, whatever the appearance may be, whatever we may see with our human eyes, the fact is that God is in control now and forever. Amen's all right. Yeah, you, you know, I'm, I'm okay with an amen. We'll try it just once more. So God is in control now and forever. Amen. So that's the theme of, of Revelation. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 21 today. Um, we're going to jump over some bits because there's a lot more in chapter 21 than we can do in, in the time. So it's going to pull out some of, the, some of the main things, jump over a few others. So verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea also was gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, dressed like a bride, beautiful, dressed for her husband. I heard a sh loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Now, to understand this chapter, you, you need to grasp right at the beginning that this is not about the creation of a new city. The city here is a symbol. The book of Revelation is, is all about symbols. So a little bit of lesson on symbols. So I hope you can still see me over here. So what's this green thing up here? Okay, it's a, it's a, is it the fire exit? So if there's a fire, do you rush over here, get a ladder, and try and climb out through this green sign? No. So the fire exit sign is not the thing. It points to the thing. That's how symbols work. Symbols are not the thing. They point to the thing. And they point to something very different. What color is the fire exit? No. What color is the fire exit? What color is the sign? What shapes the sign? Is this the same shape? Well, sort of a rectangle. But I mean, it points to something that's, that's different. So if you try, when, you know, if you try and picture in your mind a fire exit, 
based on that sign, and you think a small green rectangle that's up in the air, it doesn't help you understand about a fire exit, does it? It points to the thing, it's not the thing. You with me? So the holy city coming down from heaven isn't the thing. It's not a real city. And we're going to come to some description of it in a minute, and it's full of symbols. When, if you try and build a city like this, it's actually impossible. If you build it literally, it's 1,400 miles high. The height of the city, as described here, is 1,400 miles high. The external wall is 216 foot thick. These are symbols. So, another clue, of course, is that it's a city that is dressed like a bride. Try and get your head around that. City wearing large white dress, coming down out of heaven? I think not. So, part of the issue, of course, is that human language is just inadequate talking about what life's going to be after this human life. Because we can only think in these human categories, can't we? We only see what we can see here. And what John is describing, what he has a glimpse of in his visions, is something that is way beyond him being able to describe. So he resorts to lots and lots of symbols to try and help us. I mean things like the sea. Now I quite like sea. In fact, you know, I'm going on holiday in a few weeks' time, and I'm spending my holiday walking by the sea. It is 81 miles, but it is by the sea. I like the sea. But in heaven, there's no sea. You think, well, I quite like the sea. Well, you see, the sea is a symbol in Revelation, as elsewhere in Scripture, of a whole load of evil things. The sea is actually a symbol of evil. I'm not going to explain why that is now. You come and ask me another time if you want to. But the sea is a symbol of evil. And so in heaven, there is no sea. It's not about there aren't going to be... I mean, I've got no idea whether there's going to be water and waves. It's not about that. It's saying that in heaven, there is no evil. Every evil thing will be missing. And it's very important, by the way, as we go through this chapter, not just to notice what is going to be in eternity, but what is going to be missing. I'm just as excited about what's not going to be there as what is going to be there. Because there are some things about this life that actually I'd rather be without. And I'm sure you would as well. Things like pain, things like death. Things like mourning and hurt and sadness. I'm quite looking forward to none of that being around, aren't you? None of that's going to be in heaven. As we'll see as we go through. Well, let's think about bride for a minute. What do you think this, this image is about? I mean, stop, you know, stop trying to think of about a big city dressed in a big white dress and floating down out of the sky. But, but what does the image of bride convey? What do, you think, what do you think that image is about? When you think about a bride being beautifully prepared for her husband. What's that image about? Say again. It's the church. Yes, it is the church. Yep, that's us. But, but why, why pictured as a bride? What's, what's special about, about brides? What do you think? Say again. They're all in. Yeah, yeah. Say, say that into here so it gets recorded. They're all in love. Yeah, brides are in love. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit more than that as well. That's a, that's good. There, there's no sin, and they're dressed in white because it's all pure. Okay. Yeah, the whole dressed in white, pure. Something else as well. It's the start of a new life. Absolutely. Start of a brand new life, a new beginning. There's more as well. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get to you over there. Let me, sorry about that. When you say a bride um, all dressed up, um, 
the brides, they always look beautiful. And when we're all in church, and we're all looking to see what they're like, we're taking photographs of them, they look gorgeous and wonderful. So I just picture it's going to be beautiful and shiny and wonderful up there as well. Very good. Um, quite a few of you here have been brides, I suspect. Uh, I just try and just think back to the, you know, think about that. Well, well, that was what I was thinking about, was why did I wear a dress instead of jeans and a T-shirt when I got married to Warren? So, you know, it's probably more likely he was going to wear jeans and a T-shirt. But the, the wedding clothes were, you know, there was a lot of care taking over picking them. And it's about recognising that people are looking at you, but also about marking the specialness of that day. And I think I would suggest there's a bit of respect and honour coming into that as well, wanting... So for me, I wanted to look good for my husband. I wanted him to have a, a bride in a lovely dress coming down the aisle. So I made the effort for him as much as for me wanting to have a, a fabulous frock. It was actually thinking about him. Okay. Yeah, very good. There's something else as well. I'll give you, I'll give you a hand in a minute if we're not going to get there. Um, well, a husband chooses a wife, mm. so this wife is chosen, mm. and she's come along to a ceremony to agree to live with her husband in unison. That's mm. what I get from it. Yeah. And that, that in unison, actually, is, is about intimacy, isn't it? Isn't it interesting that the image that is chosen here for the relationship between the church, who's part of church, by the way? Just yeah, so image has chosen about your relationship with Jesus is one that actually is about intimacy. You know, without unpacking too much, you know, on, on, on the night of the wedding, you know, there is there is a unison, there's a unity, there's a joining together that actually is the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman. Is that not the case? And that's the image that's chosen here. It's one of closeness, it's one of love, it's one of care, and it's one of intimacy. And that's the picture here of the relationship between us, church, and Jesus. And, and then there is this next phrase. It says, look, God's home is now among his people. We're going to come back to it later in the chapter. But it's interesting. There, in, in the word that is used there, there is a link back to the Old Testament word of tabernacle. In the Old Testament, there was a tent which the people of Israel carted around with them called the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle was where God's presence was. It was, if you like, his, his home. But they didn't believe he was confined to the tabernacle, but it was the place where you met with God. There also is a link in, in the Greek word that's used here to, to the word that's used for God's glory, the Shekinah Hebrew word that we use in the Old Testament. And the theme of this chapter, actually, is all about God being with his people. It's an amazing thing, just... Just, um, just, just think about this. God making his home with his people. It's an amazing image. The creator and sustainer of the entire universe is making his home with his people. Isn't that phenomenal? And we are, at the moment, as church, being got ready for that, for God to come and dwell. And, and you have a sense at the minute, for those of you, you have the Holy Spirit inside you, don't you? And the Holy Spirit cries, Abba, Father, there's a sense of God's presence with you. This is only a taste, brothers and sisters, of what it's going to be like to have God with us. God at home among his people. More of that as we go into the chapter. We'll, we'll come back to that. Just uh, Let me just read that verse 4 again to you. Here's a list of things that are missing from, from heaven. 
He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. All these things are gone forever. Amen. Amen. So it's not just being excited about what is going to be there, but what's not going to be there. Verse 5. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars... Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. First song we sang in our worship today, I think it was the first one, Alpha and, he is the Alpha and the Omega. It's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And it was used as as a symbol, a form of speech that, means that God is in control at the beginning, the Alpha, in control at the end, the Omega, and everything in between. The whole of history, it'll play on words, it only works in English, but the whole of history is in fact his story. God's story, his story, history. From the beginning, before creation, before creation, all the way through to the end, God is, and God is in control, all the way through, every moment, every part of every aspect of that. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, this phrase that's used here, um, all who are victorious will inherit these blessings. Uh, This phrase, all who are victorious, is is a theme of this letter. It, It refers to people in the context of Revelation and in our context as well, of people who refuse to compromise in terms of their obedience to God. For them, the first recipients of this letter, and for many of our brothers and sisters in the world today, not true for us in the UK, that refusal to compromise with the standards of society, the requirements of government opposed to the living God, can result in persecution and death. And that was the experience of Christians who were receiving this letter. But those who refuse to compromise, those who remain faithful, whether they lose their physical lives or not, they will be my children. This is an Old Testament promise made to King David, fulfilled in Jesus, now fulfilled for all believers. And we receive... An inheritance. Now, I unpacked that a few weeks ago when we were looking at at 1 Peter, so I'm not going to unpack that today. But we receive an inheritance. However, there's a list here. The background to this was those who participated in emperor worship. For us today, it's the worship of any other idol. Such people will not be a part of God's eternal people. The phrase liar here might strike you as being a bit, a bit odd. Um, speaking of truth is something which is a very important value for Christians. 
But the particular context of the word here is about Christians who what they say does not match what they do. It's more of the context of being a hypocrite. So, just read through if you've, if you've got uh, access to Bible in front of you or just remember to think back over these verses, verse 5 to verse 8 from Alpha and Omega, uh, all of the stuff that's there. Thinking about today, it's August, it's 2019, here in West London, what do those verses say to you today about your situation? What does it say to us today? It's all very well understanding this is what it meant for people back in those days. That's important to do that. But we also need to be asking, what does it say to us today? What does it say to you? What are you encouraged by? What are you challenged by? Gradually, some hands are appearing. Thank you. It's like you said, God is in control, and I have nothing to fear, and that my future is with my God, and my salvation is secure in him. And whatever happens, I, nothing can take that away. Nothing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Also, for us as a church today, that we should be prepared as a, as, a, as, a, as a bride prepare for the day of the wedding, we should be prepared to, for that day when the groom will be here. And also the encouragement to know that he's already he's making a home, he's going to make a permanent residence with us. And as we know, we are on a journey. The, the permanent home is something to look forward to. Again, like getting married, moving, looking forward to moving into your husband's house and making a home together. Now, because you remember the legion, I don't do this to, to people in... in church in general, so I'm just trying to reduce anxiety here, but for you as a leader, I'm, I'm happy to come back with another question, because you, you said making ourselves as church, we need to make ourselves ready as bride. What's in your mind when you, when you say that? Um, not being an hypocrite and also walking towards, I'm going to use a metaphor again, um, a journey where you have to for every stop, we are, in, we are on a stop at the moment on a train. Um, there's always a final stop for that train. So it's getting ready for each part. And as a church, I don't know how to break it down gently, that we should be alert and just walking towards, walking each day towards the return of the, of the king. Thank you very much. Anybody else? What does this passage say to you today? Okay. It says to me, does my action match my words? And if I say one thing, do I do something else? And especially when I'm with my non-believer friends, um, I portray what Jesus has told me that I should be. That's what it means to me. Great, thank you. We're giving you lots of leg exercises, walking backwards and front across you there. I would say vig to be vigilant on the Lord, to trust in his word and meditate on his word every day, for that is our bread. That is our, that is our food. That's our spiritual food. That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us driving. And when it says about the second death, that for, to me, I envisioned a time before when this happened before. So obviously this is a new type of death. So it's even more apparent that we as believers of Christ stay wholeheartedly in his, in his teachings and do not divert from them. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, let's move on to the next, uh, next part of the passage. Uh, verse 9. One of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come with me. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. 
So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high, with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels, and the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them was written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And that's about the fact that it is uh, the, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, preaching the gospel. And that gospel is the foundation, that proclamation of the gospel is the foundation of the church. The angel who talked to me, verse 15, held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates and its wall. And when he'd measured it, he found it was a square, as high as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick, according to the human standard used by the angel. The wall was made of jasper. The city was as pure gold, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seven chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth Uh, Chrysopaz, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl, and the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. So, this city is shaped like a cube. The same height, depth, and length. Does that remind anybody of anything in the Old Testament? What building in the Old Testament was a cube? There's only one. Mm, Close. It was the Holy of Holies. Inside the temple was shaped like a cube. What was in the Holy of Holies? In the Holy of Holies was the place where God rested his feet. It was where he was most present. The high priest was allowed once a year to go into the Holy of Holies. Here, this city is imaged as being like the Holy of Holies. It's where God is absolutely present. How often do we get to go there? We live there. Isn't that amazing? God makes his home with his people. His presence immediately available. I mean, the high priest went once a year into the Holy of Holies. We, the image here, we live completely and totally immersed and surrounded by God's presence. Those of you that are good at maths will have noticed the way the number 12 keeps cropping up and multiples of the number 12 keeps uh, keeps cropping up all the way through here. And uh, that's a symbol of the uh, Old Testament people of God. There were 12 tribes. There were 12 disciples. This number 12 symbolizes the ongoing community of faith, as Wall puts it in in his writing. Uh, Measuring. Uh, Well, measuring is is also a symbol. So, again, everything in this is symbol. Measuring is, is a symbol of fact, it's God's, if you like, certification, as one writer put it. God saying, you know, this is how it's going to be. I, I, if it's like his signature, his certificate, that this is going to happen. This symbolic huge wall, I mean, 216 feet thick, I mean, that's a wall, isn't it? <laughs> why, why is that so ridiculously thick? Well, it's because it's a symbol. What is a symbol of? This is secure. You know, no battering rams going through a 216-foot-thick wall. 
it's symbolizing that inside this city, totally, completely secure. There's this link, there's a list of 12 jewels there. Anybody who's really smart in Old Testament stuff would recognize that list because they crop up in the Old Testament. They crop up on the ephod, on the, on the breastplate that the high priest wore once a year to go into the Holy of Holies. It's the same list. And here's one of the other weird things that you might or might not know. On each of those jewels in the Old Testament, the name of one of the tribes was written. You see how all of this is symbolic here? About, you know, this God's presence here, what was symbolized in the Old Testament, is now going to become a reality for us. And all these images about what this city is going to be like, pure gold, clear as glass. One of the images for, for God's um, presence is light. Find it in the Old Testament, New Testament. Just to, So all of this shiny stuff, all of this clear as glass, all of this, it's all about the transmission of God's presence. There are no shadows in heaven. thought about that no shadows because shadows are linked with you know what goes on in the shadows it's all a bit dodgy isn't it yeah there are no shadows there's no sun by the way and no moon either so I mean there are no shadows at all everything is 100% lit by God's presence but one of the other thing I like to like about this um now, heaven, you just look at these images here and, and just the brightness and the, and the color, it ain't going to be boring. In, in fact, just for amusement, there is a New Testament writer on Revelation whose name is Boring. I kid you not, this is real, his name is Boring. And he wrote this. Eternity is no odorless, colorless, tasteless void. It's a living city of color and light. Isn't that great? So, we're going to come to the last bit. One more bit to read. We're going to come to that in a moment. So just think for a moment about this passage, this description of this symbolic city. How this morning... Does this passage encourage you? How this morning does this passage that we've just read here encourage you? Mm. You can tell I'm encouraged because I'm running up and down and shouting a lot. Just um, and tells me not to worry. He he's got everything in control. Doesn't matter what I'm going through. He's there with me. I have I should not but no. Don't worry myself. Just follow him. Very good. Anybody else? Let me. I'm on my way to you with the mic. God God is is with you wherever you go. When you get baptized, God takes you by the hand. So wherever you, wherever, it doesn't matter where you are in the, in this world, God is with you wherever you go, and will keep you in away from harm's way and away from His enemies. Leg exercise time again. That's it. <laughs> um, God's transparency is transparency is more I seek in the Lord um, because when he sees us he only sees one person and that's his son mm -hmm. that lives within us so if I can s allow that to shine through me and allow God to see that then I want him to be pleased and, mm -hmm. and not feel and not have this you know this um, and feel condemned in that sense that's, that's, that's it our hope is not in this world our hope is in heaven with God forever I'm glad you said that. I'm just about to 
just begin to think about talk about that because you know when when life is when life is tough and from time to time for all of us life is tough isn't it is that that's not the re, that's the reality of life at times life is tough but we actually when you look beyond what's in front of you and picture what's to come it helps you through the tough time you know we are not as people without hope our hope is in god our hope is in this promise, this inheritance, this being, living with God. God making his home with us. All of that there, it's there in front of us. It's our destiny, isn't it? Well, it's mine. It's our destiny, isn't it? Yes. You excited? Yes. And that helps us deal with the rubbish that comes our way sometimes in this life, doesn't it? Because we're focused. Now, yes, we have to deal with this. We're focused on that because we know that's what's coming. Okay, last part of the chapter. From verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there's no night there. All the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. Nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now throughout Revelation... Uh, in this chapter and elsewhere, John draws on a whole range of Old Testament passages. And, and in the background here is the book of Ezekiel. But there's something really striking that's different. In, in the book of Ezekiel, the writing of the prophet Ezekiel, there is a, a picture of the new Jerusalem. And in that picture, there are seven chapters devoted to describing the rebuilt temple. Because it was really important, because that's where God was going to be. Uh, there is no temple here in this city. There's no temple. Why is there no temple? Because God's everywhere. You don't, he's, he's unmediated wherever you are, 100% in God's presence. There's no special place to go. He's not more present somewhere than somewhere else. There is no temple. There's something else that's missing as well. In Ezekiel, there is this, um, this wall. I, mean, I know there's a wall here, but there's a wall in the city that divides the holy from the not holy. Uh, missing. Not there. Because everything is holy. There's nothing unholy there. There's no night. Again, with symbolic stuff here. Night, it's a time of, often of anxiety, of fear. Darkness allows activities to go on that wouldn't happen in daylight. None of that. None of that. No shadows, nothing, no night. It's all in God's light. I notice again the echo here. We've looked at it before on another occasion earlier in Revelation. It talks about people from every tribe, every tongue, being present there before the Lamb. We see it again here. People from every nation who are there. Even from nations that have opposed God. There are people from within those nations that will come to faith. Their names will have been written in the book of life. Whoa. But not everyone gets there. There again is this warning here. Nothing evil be allowed to enter nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We'll leave that there. We're going to come back to this in two weeks' time. We'll look at the final chapter. Three things I want to underline this morning as we uh, come to an end of the teaching. Faithful believers are going to spend eternity in God's presence. There'll be nothing evil there. I'm glad there's an amen to that because I'm really pleased about that. Therefore, now, 
in August 2019, you and I should be encouraged to live faithful lives that serve God fully and completely. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.